Welcome everyone to the September Parks and Rec Board meeting. Um, I will read the appeal of decisions. Pursuant to the provisions of 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Board of Parks and Recreation may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for a review under a common law writ of certiorari. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. All right, we will move to the consideration of minutes from the last meeting, assuming everyone's read them. Are there any changes? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The minutes carry. Um, we're going to uh, defer the special presentations to the end of our business meeting. Um, moving on to Metro Council referrals. Monique. All right. Um, well, as for deferral to the naming committee, Councilmember Ed Kendall requests board approval to name the band shell located in Hadley Park in honor of Mr. Don Q. Pullen. Uh, staff is. Uh, requesting a deferral to the naming committee. Accept the motion for deferral. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, moving on to old business. 011707, the Parks Board to revisit the February 2017 decision regarding Tony Rose Park to temporarily close a portion of the park located at 8 Music Circle East for an extended period of time during the construction phase of an adjacent building. I think we have someone here to present. Hello? The neighborhood from the community. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Rachel Topper Zilcher, and you may remember me because I was here just last month. Um, <clears throat> well, we've come a long way in less than two months' time from the initial outrage and, frankly, disbelief um, that, unbeknownst to us, Tony Rose Park would be used by a private entity um, to the now shared pride that our community helped to create something better together. I'd like to thank all the parties for agreeing to reset the process so that our community could be involved. Although we are pleased with the good faith effort by all and the beautiful outcome that you have submitted to you, um, we implore you not to enter into another agreement such as this without community involvement. Notice I did not say don't do it. Um, there are times when public-private uh, partnerships can work for all, but to do so without the community engagement is to exclude those that you're meant to serve. Our community is now very pleased with the park design and we hope that you'll accept it as presented. Thank you, Hawkins Partners, for listening to our community and drafting a plan the neighborhood can be proud of for years to come. And thank you, Whitfield and Hayne Hamilton of Panatoni, for participating at every step. They were at every meeting um, for, their for your professionalism and for your generous upgrades. We now feel as though this partnership between Panatoni, Metro Parks, and Edge Hill is a win-win-win. Thank you. Are there any questions? I applaud getting everybody together and doing this. I agree, and your point's well taken about public input. So Thank we'll, you. we've so noted. Um, if there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second? Second. No. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you for your hard work on that. It's Thank a good win-win. Yes, win. <laughs> there you go. Uh, moving on to 021709, Mr. Scott Tigert requests amendment of the Parks and Greenways Master Plan to reflect the relocation of the Miracle Field concept from Shelby Park to Warner Park. I guess I'll speak to that. Um, Scott's not here. He's flying because of all of the hurricane stuff that's going on, so he was called out. I believe Ms. Tigert might be here somewhere. Oh, back there. Um, Two years ago, Scott came before the Park Board and asked to, for the Park Board to approve the donation of a miracle field at Warner Park rather than where it was originally on a master plan at Shelby Park. At that time, there were a number of questions uh, that needed to be answered from the staff, uh, from friends of Warner Park, uh, just a lot of uncertainty at that time. Since that time, uh, and, and initially, he was coming before the board to do it as West National Sports League doing the donation. Since then, they have created a 501c3 called 
Miracle League of Music City. So the music, the Miracle League of Mu Music City is requesting that the Park Board approve them to solicit sponsorship, design, build, and donate a Miracle Field at Warner Park. We have, uh, he, ha he and the staff have answered the questions that the Friends of Warner Park had. He has answered the questions that the staff has had. There are more details, you know, as we move along that will need to take place, but in order to move forward, we need park board approval to start the process. So at this point, the staff is in support of this motion. Are there any questions? Could you explain what a miracle field is? A is miracle it, it field. Sounds like there's more than one. So. Well, a miracle field is a uh, normally a rubber surface like a baseball field that those with disabilities are able to participate in sporting activities. Uh, they recently built one in Murfreesboro, I believe, and it would be a wonderful thing to have in our system. So Thank we're you. very much in support of this. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. <coughs> 091705, Mr. Dan Dummermuth re representing uh, the Northwest YMCA request board approval for Metro Parks to acquire and take over operation of the Northwest YMCA during the year of 2018 and manage the facility as a regional center. Um, since the publication of this agenda, they, uh, the YMCA has asked that we delay this decision to January 2018. So we will wait on that. What was the reason for the delay? I just think they want to, um, my opinion, I think, Monique, uh, Monique, because they want to talk more with the um, members of the Y there and the, um, and have public input. Sure. They want to engage the engage, engage stakeholders in a more thorough way and just look at this option, make sure it's the, the proper way to proceed. Now we'll move to the consent agenda. There are two items of note in the consent agenda. One, I'm going to ask Jim Hester to give us uh, just uh, an update on one of the items that does not require a vote and will stay in the consent agenda. Jim? Okay. Well, as you know, normally with the consent agenda, we bat things pretty thoroughly and make sure we've got an agreement with everybody beforehand. But every now and then something comes up and we just want to make sure that we brought it to your attention and that's what we're doing with this one. In particular, the American Artisan is on the schedule to get approved as an event to happen next Father's Day. American Artisan was an event that happened for many years at the park, and a lot of people remember going to it for a long time. It went away, and then in the period of time it went away, we had another very popular event come up that's part of the conservancy for the Parthenon, the Musician's Corner. And so between those two events, we're balancing and juggling and trying to make them uh, work out together. And then we also throw in the fact that the Parthenon Lawn is going to be out of commission for next summer. It's going to make it pretty tight, and so what we're talking about doing is allowing this conservancy event, the Musicians' Corner, to take place at the same time as American Artists and right next to each other. So there still could be some potential conflict, but as staff, we're going to work with maintenance and parks police and everybody to make sure we work out those details, but we just wanted to make sure you knew about it. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, and the second item we need, and I think we need to pull out and vote on separately, uh, is under ampl amplification alcohol and fundraising. Third bullet point down, eighth annual back to bridge mixer, Cumberland Park, Friday, September 29th. Who would like to report on that? Um, go ahead. Sure. Um, so the back to bridge, I don't, Sharon Hurt's not here, is she? Uh, the, is there a representative here for uh, Council Member Hurt? I guess not. Go ahead. Okay, so the Back to Bridge Mixer has taken place many years. Normally it has taken place on the pedestrian bridge, but now we're there because of a conflict with another event that's happening, that pedestrian bridge was built as a pedestrian bridge, mm -hmm. and so they're trying to move all of the events that close the bridge off of the bridge. And luckily we are able to accommodate the Back to Bridge Mixer in Cumberland Park, which is right below the bridge, so that you're looking up <coughs> at it instead of being on it. But the difference with this particular event is that park normally closes at 11 o'clock and also we don't normally allow any event to have amplification after 11 o'clock. But the Back to Bridge Mixer has always had, it goes actually until 1 a.m. So that's part of their request 
is to have an event that goes until one with amplification. Now there has been there have been no problems in the past with that on the bridge, and it's right below the bridge, so we don't really anticipate that there should be an issue. But we also didn't want to do that without the Parks Board uh, reviewing that and deciding whether they want us to let it happen. Well, the issue that was brought to our attention, um, amplification after 11 o'clock is a real problem, as we know, because of a Ascend uh, Amphitheater, and I think we've got to be real careful setting precedent, allowing that to happen, it's my opinion. So, are there any questions? about it so what's the, the suggestion is to not allow it um, I would defer to the parks board so the request is to go up to to um, extend it to what is it, 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. 1 a.m. that's the request that is the request I just think we have to be real careful doing that because uh, we don't allow anybody else to do that and you've got residents that are in close proximity <coughs> and they've they voiced some opinions as to loud noise also, so uh, I think it's a twofold. So I'd recommend <coughs> we don't do that if anybody would like to make a motion. I'll move that. A second? Second. Is there uh, any discussion? All those in favor of not allowing it to proceed or go later than 11? Um, I'll signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. All right. So now we'll consider the balance of the consent agenda in its entirety if that is acceptable for everyone um, oh unless second second any questions opposed <coughs> the, um, consent agenda carries. <coughs> moving on to new business uh, 091703 staff request board approval to accept the donation of a new scoreboard and installation valued at fourteen thousand two hundred and forty dollars to be placed on the baseball field in two rivers park those Jeff Haynes. We did it. No, we didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, Jeff. I meant to do you earlier and I didn't. I skipped over my notes. Um, back to Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Too much going on. 091702 Park Board to affirm the annual appointment of Mr. Jeff Haynes representing the Metro Planning Commission as a member of the Parks Board, effective August 10th, 2017. Uh, Mr. Haynes' term will expire May 31st, 2018, and he'll be, as we said in here, representing Metro Planning. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Welcome aboard, Jeff. Glad Thank to have you. you. Thank you. All right, now going to uh, 091703. Uh, I've already read that on the scoreboard. Is there anybody going to report on that? John? Uh, at Two Rivers, all of the sports fields are actually on park property. Two of the softball fields, we uh, permit to an outside group, but the baseball field, uh, football field, and two of the old softball fields are actually under the uh, care and direction of the school. The scoreboard that the baseball field uses actually sits in the outfield of one of our softball fields. The, school, the baseball team has requested to relocate that to an area between the two fields, which is actually good on our part because it's safer because then the out, you don't run into it in the outfield. Uh, and they have gotten a donation. So it's actually a donation to the McGavick baseball team, but because it will be on our property and will belong to us, the park board needs to accept the donation. So the park, the staff does support this donation. Motion. Motion to accept the Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. 091704 staff request board approval terminate to terminate loan agreement between the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force and Metro Parks. With regard to the F-86 jet located in Centennial Park. Uh, the Jet that you're probably all familiar with in the park currently has been on lease to Metro Parks since 1961 from the um, National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. Um, 
It was installed in 1961. It was relocated to its current location in 1981. Every year that lease is renewed and that doesn't normally come to the board. Um, that renewal is just uh, uh, signed by the director uh, and the mayor's office and uh, is, is perpetuated. Um, recently, the 118th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron of the Tennessee Air National Guard at Berry Field, um, the local uh, Air National Guard group, uh, has requested, made a request to us that they be able to relocate the jet to their site at Berry Field. This is the same, the, the 118th is the same group that originally facilitated the installation of the park, of the jet in the park in 1961. Um, the Centennial Park Master Plan does not identify a location for this jet. The master plan assumes that that jet is going to go somewhere else. Um, a year or so ago when you all approved the lease to the Nashville uh, Steam Preservation Society of the locomotive, um, part of that process also is to move that locomotive out of the park um, and then get it into working order and begin running excursions out of Riverfront Park. In order to move the locomotive, the jet has to move. We've now been presented with an opportunity from the 118th in order to permanently relocate that jet. Um, the process with the um, National Museum of the U.S. Air Force is first uh, for us to um, terminate the lease agreement, and then they have already approved relocation of the jet to the 118th. So this is a, uh, uh, from the staff's perspective, it's a responsible way to fulfill part of the recommendations of the Centennial Park Master Plan, um, and it takes the jet back to the constituency that first facilitated its installation in the park, back to its home, because it originally flew out of the 118th, and they'll be a good steward of the jet, and it will, uh, there will be continue to be a public visibility of the jet. So park uh, recommends board approval of not renewing the jet lease. So. We accept the, accept the, the uh, proposal not to renew the lease. Do I have a second? Second. Right. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Opposed? Uh, the motion carries. Thank you for that, Tim. And last new business <laughs> item 091705, staff request board approval of a slope easement as Asifra, at Asifran Park to permit grading and landscaping on the adjacent property. I think there's a request for deferral on that. Request to deferral to the acquisition committee. All right, we'll defer uh, to the acquisition committee for next committee meetings. Um, all right, we're gonna move to upcoming special events. Jackie? Yes, I have a number of events for you. You'll notice on your calendar we have a full month of the events scheduled for September. But a couple of uh, events I want to call to your attention. We have two open houses scheduled to present the draft of the master plan uh, for Southeast Davidson and Stones River Regional Parks. Uh, the open house for Stones River Regional Park begins mm -hmm. at noon on September 20th, and Southeast Davidson Regional Park is scheduled to begin at noon on September 21st. Uh, staff will be on hand to answer questions uh, about the draft and to get additional public comments. There's even a special session on both days for children uh, in the area to be able to give their opinions about what they think should happen in the park. Uh, so that's one. Dinner on the Bridge is a fundraiser for Greenways of Nashville. is scheduled for 6 p.m. Thursday, September 28th on the John Sigenthaler Pedestrian Bridge, and we hope you'll plan to attend that. The tickets are available online, and they go very, very quickly, from what I understand. That has been relocated to Cumberland Park. Okay. Night. So it's, I don't know if you heard that. <coughs> the event has been relocated to Cumberland Park on the same night. Uh, also going on, the Parthenon, at the Parthenon, is a day at the fair with David Ewan. Uh, we've had uh, this particular exhibit at the Parthenon before. It returns to the West Gallery of the Parthenon. Uh, the exhibit is a celebration of the Tennessee Centennial Exhibition with artifacts chosen from David Ewan's personal collection. Uh, it gives modern day travelers or uh, 
many of us a feel for what it must have been like to visit uh, Centennial Park uh, back during the exhibition over 100 years ago. And that particular exhibit runs through the end of the year. Uh, other events that we have scheduled is the Nashville Humane Association's Dog Days and Mutt Strut. Uh, is this Saturday in Centennial Park is one of our more uh, popular events along with um, the Taco Fall Craft Fair. It begins on September 22nd and it runs for two days. That's also in Centennial Park. Over at Hadley Park we have the African Street Festival. It's scheduled to begin on September 22nd and it will run through that Sunday afternoon. So that's it for special events. Yes. Yes, I can. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, any department updates that anyone would like to bring up? Department heads? Uh, Tim, capital projects? Sure, you've got the um, one page uh, sheet in front of you with updates and I'll hit the highlights. Uh, as a Fran Park, I think some of you were able to um, join us in Conexion Americas for the groundbreaking for that event in, in August. I was not able to be there and I, I'm really sorry I missed it. But construction is now underway uh, by Conexion Americas in, um, in uh, uh, partnership with Metro Parks. We're partially funding that. Um, and that is slated to be completed sometime this winter. So when we get closer to that point, there will be a, a ribbon cutting event associated with it and we'll let you know about that. Uh, Fannie Mae Dees Park, the Dragon Restoration. This is a partnership with the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Association. Initially, there had been talk about doing a community build project for the portions of the Dragon where the tiles had been completely lost. As they've gone through the structural repairs on the Dragon, they've actually been able to restore most of the original tile work on the Dragon. So there are just some patches that will require total retiling. And so sort of the community participation component of that uh, is now not going to happen. Um, uh, which would have been fun, but uh, I guess the upside is that the dragon's in better shape than we thought it was going to be. Um, so they are moving forward on that, and um, ultimate completion will probably be in spring because we are working with a few, uh, a, a handful of trained volunteers on that as well. The Hadley Tennis Building, which has been just a, the most difficult project um, on the list here probably for uh, various reasons, um, is underway. We've taken down the old bubble. The new bubble structure will arrive in October, and that's really the, the um, piece that we need in place in order to get out there and start doing visible work. The, the um, general contractor is doing some engineering work and supplemental survey work, so there is work being done but nothing visible is happening on the site and I know that that can be frustrating but we are looking at, at mid-October to really kind of go hot and heavy on that site. Um, Madison Community Center uh, construction continues on that uh, with the roof mechanical site, ba uh, site uh, paving, field grading, um, uh, we're looking at a spring opening for that at Orchard Bend, uh, which will be the new multi-use field complex uh, in the southeastern part of the county. All of the fields have been sprigged and they're now working on grading for parking lots and other improvements. Um, Jackie mentioned the um, Stones River Bend master plan and the Antioch Southeast master plan uh, project for which we'll have some open house meetings next week. These are just really exciting and if you aren't able to make it to any of those open houses, we'd be happy to share uh, some of those materials with you. These are going to be um, major new defining parks for Nashville and we're really excited about what we have to, to share with the community. Um, Smith, Springs, Smith Springs Community Center is on a similar schedule as Madison Community Center, maybe a week or so uh, behind them. Uh, steel framing is going in, um, the, the track is up around the gym, uh, block work is nearly up. Um, <coughs> And Edwin Warner Birch Reserve Connector Phase 2. This is the tunnel under uh, the railroad tracks near Highway 100. Uh, the tunnel has been in for some time, um, and the stone end walls, the finished masonry work, is now going up on those. Um, so we're starting, it's starting to actually come out of the ground and, and look like something real, uh, and we've got a couple of months left on that. Um, 
West Park, uh, we're looking at a dedication uh, event to be scheduled for early November, so we've still got a little bit of time on that. That's a project that's being uh, constructed by Metro Water Services, really a, a total redo of the park. Any Thank questions? You. Any questions for Tim? All right. Uh, now we're going to move to the special presentations. Uh, we have two groups request uh, to give us presentations uh, on Fort Negley and Greer Stadium site. Um, these are for informational purposes only. Uh, each, um, I'm asking each group to keep their presentation to 20 minutes. Do want to remind everyone there is an ongoing appeal in the procurement process that's 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 still there and. Uh, and before, and we made this decision two meetings ago, before there is a vote on this board, there will be, the parks will have public uh, hearings uh, prior to the final vote. So having said that, I'm gonna ask first, Mr. Clay Bailey, representing the Friends of Fort Negley, to uh, present uh, his ideas in regard to the, the ideas they have in regards to Greer Stadium. Chairman Anderson and, and Parks Board, Thank you very much for inviting us here. And um, uh, my name is Clay Bailey. I'm here representing the Friends of Fort Negley. Uh, in a moment, I will introduce four other speakers to present our vision. Some other uh, Friends of Fort Negley board members are also here, uh, as are folks representing an array of other organizations, uh, including some of those on the uh, screen you see here. Uh, this is just a sampling from local to national, uh, from historic preservation to natural preservation, et cetera. They and others have spoken out on behalf of preserving this land. Uh, and I um, have to say as well that, uh, speaking of our board, um, we, all of us are volunteers on this and very stretched because we have paying jobs. And I apologize on the front end if I have to leave before the end of the meeting. Uh, we didn't know until the 11th hour that our board member, Gary Burke, could be here. Uh, had we known earlier, he would be up here speaking as well. But Gary is a direct descendant of Peter Bailey, who was a member of the USCT, who was stationed there at Fort Negley. So we're happy to, that such a large crowd of people is here, and we're particularly happy that, that Gary could make it today. Um, the um, Friends of Fort Negley was set up through the Parks Board to, quote, protect, promote, and preserve Fort Negley Park. The um, land acquired in 1928 uh, by the City Parks Board uh, for the preservation of Fort Negley, um, it was acquired in 28. Uh, it is the largest inland fort built uh, during the Civil War and a pivotal site uh, in the Union defense of the city. Uh, and a pivotal site in the decisive Battle of Nashville. The site also has a long pre-war, pre-Civil War history as St. Cloud Hill, a downtown, uh, well, downtown Nashville's original informal green space and picnic grounds looking over City Cemetery. Now that people are moving back downtown, this historic use of that green space and parkland has never been more important for the future of our city. But it is now proposed that almost half of this site be awarded for private development, something which will forever alter the future of the park and prevent the appropriate preservation of such a locally, nationally, and globally important site uh, and prevent its use uh, or limit its use sharply to the public at large um, or by the public at large. Instead, we will urge you to follow the basics of Parks Board's own master plan of this site as it was outlined in the 2007 supplement to the master plan, uh, which thoughtfully laid out what to do with this site in a post-Greer Stadium environment. Our plan for the site, as presented by the next speaker, Ben Page, follows your own very good plan uh, and that plan has not, uh, should not be abandoned. Uh, and it as well follows the uh, significant aspects of the 2017 plan to play. Fort Negley Park has all the components to be one of the great parks, not just for our city, but for the country. It has an unparalleled history that has been overlooked for too long. 
It is located close to downtown, uh, now with thousands of residents and millions of tourists and many more driving down I-40 and I-65. It has a topography. Um, the beautiful hilltop overlooks downtown, and that hilltop, by the way, has many unique fossils, which he, we have highlighted in various natural history programs which we've developed there. It has amazing visibility and opportunity. The site is already visited by more than 300,000 people a year coming to Adventure Science Center, which is twice the number of visitors to the Frist. In addition, to Fort Negley alone, we are averaging over 100 visitors per day, um, and that is during very limited visitor center hours alone. For anyone to claim that this park is underutilized is a perplexing claim. Um, and if you would like more details about um, park attendance and this sort of thing, I'll be happy to provide those by email. If treated properly, Fort Negley Park can realize its potential as one of a handful of iconic natural uh, and cultural and educational landmarks in the United States. Everybody driving down I-40 and 65, both local and national, should be able to look up at this monument to freedom celebrating Nashville's unique place in the Civil War and see where impressed slaves built a fort for their freedom and volunteered for military service uh, to help our country come closer to its ideals. Let's not squander this opportunity for our city to take the lead on remembering our Civil War and Reconstruction history more appropriately than we have before. Um, now I will quickly introduce uh, our next four speakers. Um, who will highlight the history uh, and the future opportunities that lie on this site. First, Nashville landscape architect Ben Page, who Friends of Fort Negley asked to take a look at the property, has helped articulate a vision, and he will talk about how Fort Negley can become an iconic park, the jewel of Nashville's park system, and the amazing ability of a landscape can tell an important story, a story that we need here to hear in the 21st century more than ever. Jane Landers and Angela Sutton will follow him. Uh, they are a history professor and postdoctoral fellow, respectively, at Vanderbilt, and they will talk about the global significance of the site um, of Fort Negley and its UNESCO um, <coughs> slave trails designation, commemorating the significance of this part of Nashville to the nation and the world. Ann Roberts will follow them. She is former director uh, former executive director of the Metro Historic Zoning Commission uh, and of the Metro Historical Commission, and she will talk about how Nashville placed the entire site in a historic landmark overlay district in the year 2005 in order to preserve and protect this heritage. Do not abandon these uh, protections. Use them to create something truly special. We are so appreciative uh, for the work that all four of you who will be presenting um, have done. And like the Friends of Fort Negley and so many other organizations that have gotten involved on this issue, uh, we are doing it because we care. Uh, and in spite of having very busy schedules with our paid jobs, uh, Ben Page is up next. And thank you, Ben, for being here. Well, thank you all f for the uh, opportunity to be here. And I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've ever been in a room with a president. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, what an opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Um, there's an amazing thing going on in Nashville, Tennessee, as you all see every single day of your lives. Nashville is the energized city, the most amazing place to live. I've lived here 67 of my 68 years and see daily the changes. And when uh, the Friends of Fort Negley came to our office, I was more than excited, more than thrilled to offer our talents to look at the opportunity. And I'm going to suggest to you this is a very narrow perspective on it's the landscape perspective on what Fort Negley represents. Anne and Angela and Jane will speak much more elegantly about the history part of it. So don't expect me to be the great history part. What we do in our office in a typical setting is when we've got an exciting project like this, we gather together and we have what we call a charrette. A charrette is a um, mechanical tool in which you evaluate a site's potential and opportunities. You put everything on the table, you ask a lot of questions, and you essentially wind up with 
and I'm so sorry you're not going to be able to see this from over there, with what this uh, graphic on the left side represents. Um, and out of our charrette came 13 salient points of strength for this project, the idea of a dynamic park. <coughs> These are all component parts of the uh, evaluation process. We looked for opportunities for views, um, what's there geographically, horticulturally. It's a, it's a very minutely based uh, study of the whole site. The first one we uncovered was, of course, the most obvious. You have this spectacular 19th century fort, one of three in the world that are star-shaped. Wow, that's a big old deal. Then the next thing we uncovered was the incredibly rich story of the actual construction of this magnificent fort. I hate to tell you, I've lived in Nashville 67 to 68 years. I had no idea the magnitude of this, and it's major impressive. The self-freed slaves that built this, extraordinary examples of craftsmanship and um, just pure bravura. We chronicle, we chronicle the breathtaking beauty of the commanding site. If you stood in the middle of that site, you can see 360 degrees all the way around Nashville. It is unbelievably elegant. And as Clay has stated, 300,000 people currently visit the um, Adventure Science Center right there at the front door of this park. 40,000 of those are students. <clears throat> And this part cannot be overemphasized, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer for you all, but um, through the, uh, I guess, fate, I-65 and I-40 literally bent to uh, avoid this site, <coughs> but create this amazing window onto this site. How many of you have driven by at night and seen this glorious thing after the trees have been removed? It is unbelievable. I mean, it is an amazing piece of geographic, um, uh, uh, topography. The ex oh, thank you. Um, the existing 55-acre site, while badly encroached upon by the adjacent Greer Stadium and parking, offers unbelievable opportunities. Um, here's where we, the people in our office just literally delved into this and had the best time. This is the part that is in question right here. And guess what? Look at that enormous piece of real estate. You remove Greer Stadium from that setting, and suddenly an enormous, elegant landscape shows up. Um, lawns <clears throat> capable, this lawn right here is capable of hosting comparable civic scale functions like the Great Lawn that's evolving at Centennial Park. So again, we have another outdoor living room for the people of Nashville right here. The creation of extensive bike and hiking trails. Well, we wanted to overlay an entire idea of how this can activate a park. It is a park. So this system right here, loops and loops, you've got almost two and a half miles of potential bike trails, hiking trails. Another opportunity. Civic scale horticulture was a big deal for us because we're landscape architects. <laughs> and all of us had been on a field trip to the Lurie Gardens in Chicago and knew what an incredible asset the Lurie Gardens had become to the city of Chicago, intellectually, physically, and emotionally. The Chicagoans love that park because of that park, because of those gardens. You have already dramatically as I say, open the curtains onto this site when you took, when you, in your prescient world, committed to taking the, the site back to its 19th century landscape. Well, guess what? Look what it did. An entire proscenium stage where millions of people process by this park every, every year. I mean, it's an amazing. So the drawing of the curtain back was something that I felt was like an, a huge asset. And I believe you should set aside a portion of this park, and I'm going to use the word honor. I would like to say to all of us, we should honor the, the things that happened here. We should honor this. It's a very complex part of our history. It's part of who we are, and we're knitting it back together, hopefully, to a better world. But if we can honor those individuals who gave their lives and this site, if you'll look right there, what we did was we put it on the site where the actual quarry where these people would have worked is. And we don't know what it would look like. This is hypothetical. 
people in our office had a field day imagining the reflective quality of, of mirror water and the place to gather and talk. But look at the next thing. This is the part, I would, this is where I'm gonna throw something over the bow right here. I grew up in a Nashville where the Peace Monument was a dominant image issue at the end of Woodmont Boulevard. You could not miss it. You could not miss the fact that it represented peace. And I grew up with that. Well, then all of a sudden, the tornado came, it disappeared. Sadly, it reappeared in a place where nobody sees it. <laughs> I mean, nobody. And what we would like to suggest is, and this is, this is what has fun with these charrettes, you know, you throw a bomb over the shoulders, and I guess it's because we worked for a, a long time in Washington, and every time I flew into Washington, I saw the Washington Monument. It made me proud made me proud as an American. And if we could take that peace monument, reassert its rightful role cool. as a incredibly integral to the lives of the city, the state, and the nation, bingo, look, there he is. So that's what comes out of when you get a bunch of creative kids together and have a ton of fun. Um, then, you know, Potential is linked physically and intellectually to some of National's major parks, Centennial Park, Percy Warner Park, Shelby Park, Rose Hill Park. And please remember that we're adjacent to the city cemetery. I was in Edinburgh, Scotland two weeks ago, and one of our biggest part of the tour we were taking on was the ancient Sydney Cemetery, the one where the Romans are buried. They are so proud of how it's knitted together into their city. Bingo, there it is right there, our beautiful city cemetery. Thank you, Fletch and Bill. <laughs> um, and we could become the Emerald Necklace. This beautiful park could become the Emerald Necklace, just like the city of Boston. I grew up with all my Yankee cousins who took me to all their parks, and they were always so proud. Well, guess what? We could have it. We could, again, assert this role as a piece of our Emerald Necklace. Well, I'm going to, let's see, can we move the slides? Um, Here's where the vision led. Now, I'm gonna suggest Brittany Brown is sitting right back there. She's one of the young people that have energized Nashville. We had a ball d doing this. I mean, this is literally the magic she can pull with um, a SketchUp version of how this park could literally become the epicenter of the new Nashville, the Nashville that's growing, energized, I didn't realize that Vanderbilt University owns all this. And, and then all these amazing things, I'm sorry to punch you in the eye, but, but, but all these things that are over here, every single day that I go over there, it's like, wow, something new and exciting is happening in this neighborhood. Well, <coughs> you, <coughs> excuse me, present Vanderbilt University with a vision as broad as this one, and maybe we'll get a research triangle, something out of this whole thing. I mean, look at, look at what the front yard for that facility would be. So again, Frederick Hall Olmsted said very prescently that um, the parks are our lungs of our city. Look at this. This is a big old functioning lung. It cannot be put back under, or it should not be put back under pavement. It should remain mm -hmm. a lung. And so in conclusion, as Nashville continues its bold and exciting growth, welcoming new citizens from all over the world, it seems only appropriate that we, sh we should pause and take stock of this enormously important asset, this. And like those visionary leaders who understood the importance of history and parks in the 19th and early 20th century, we should make sure that our legacy, our legacy, our generation leaves this as a legacy, and one that will be deeply appreciated by your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, and enrich the superb park this can become. It can become a superb park and become your legacy. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time, and I know we've got three more people right away. So, sorry. We have about seven minutes for everybody. Okay, we'll do this very quickly. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come speak today. I'm Jane Landers in the Department of History at Vanderbilt University. Um, I have spent my 
whole career, 25 some years, researching and preserving African American history in the Americas writ large. Uh, so beginning in Spanish Florida, going on to Cuba, Brazil, Colombia, and other places. I've been researching and then working with public historians, museum specialists, archaeologists, and so on to mark some of these very important critical sites um, across the Americas. Now I came to Nashville not knowing anything about it, um, but Dan Sharfstein from the law school and I put together a course uh, last year on historic black Nashville where we take our students out to museum sites, local sites of importance, archives, train them how to do this research to create a new generation who will appreciate the African American history, just as we do in the other countries where we go, including training them in digital humanities technology that will spread it beyond Nashville. Um, so that was one of the things that I wanted to mention is this also fits into a larger plan to raise the visibility of African American history in Nashville and beyond. Um, I worked first on a, the first free black site in what is today the United States is a, a fort also it, that was underground, not visible, in Florida. And now it has become a big uh, tourist site, reenactments as we have here. Um, it's been nominated and accepted to the UNESCO um, board as well, but also the Underground Railroad uh, of the National Park Service. And that's what we're hoping to do for Fort Nagley. Um, I was elected last year to become I'm the first U.S. member of the International Scientific Commission for the UNESCO uh, slave route project, which is uh, created in 1994, and because of the politics of the United States and UNESCO, uh, there has been no U.S. Uh, rep before, but uh, there are already some wonderful sites that you can look on the websites and see in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, uh, and this will be, it is the first nomination to UNESCO. We've already submitted it uh, to be the first site in the United States nominated for this similar designation. And um, the person who will follow me is Dr. Angela Sutton, who did most of the research for this nomination. And uh, she and Dan Sharfstein and I all teach on this subject. And we're hoping also to connect Fort Negley to many other important sites that we've located in Nashville proper to create a bigger uh, understanding of this site and introduce it into the educational curriculum as we've done in Florida. All the fourth graders in local history go to see these sites now and we can do the same thing in Nashville if we try. Um, so I'll quickly turn it over. Oh, I also wanted to say we have the American Association of State and Local History now also based in Nashville. I'm meeting with uh, the new director tomorrow to raise some of these same issues with him and expand the visibility nationally as well as internationally. Um, and now Dr. Angela Sutton. Hello, thank you so much for letting me speak here. I um, just wanted to say I'm super humbled to be in this room because the people behind me are the ones who allowed me to be able to complete this nomination uh, for Fort Negley to be placed on the UNESCO Slave Routes Project. Um, I just think the historical impact of this site can't be overstated. It's not just local history, it's not black history, it's not military history or state history or national history, it's international history, right? Like Fort Negley has so much significance and I wish I could tell you but we don't have enough time. Um, but I'd like to invite each one of you, I'm looking at all of you, if any one of you has the time, I will take you to Fort Negley myself. I will show you what I found. I will take you on a private tour. I will let you know everything because I'm so passionate about this and I really want you guys to be as well. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for your time. Um, I'm Ann Roberts. I was um, for a very long time the director of the Metro Historical Commission and the Metro Historic Zoning Commission. During my time there in May of 2005, on the initiative of the Office of the Mayor, the entire site of Fort Negley Park was designated a local historic landmark by the Metro Council. The primary purpose of local landmark status is to preserve and protect the historical and or architectural value, this is a quote, of building structures or areas of significant importance. For your additional information, um, 
had joined a number of local landmarks under the care of Metro Parks. For instance, the Parthenon and Centennial Park, Two Rivers Mansion, Warner Parks, Bells Bend Park, Sunnyside. So you already have a lot of locally designated landmarks. They are all on the National Register, but they are also, they also have this local level of protection. All of the land that Parks owns there, including the stadium property, was included because over recent decades it became recognized that it wasn't just the stone fortification walls on top of the hill that were important. There wasn't a clear understanding of that in the 70s when land was carved out for the museum and Greer Stadium but that all of St. Cloud Hill had been the location of an event that made a highly significant contribution to local, state, and national history. You've just heard about that. Speaking for myself, I know of no more important site in the South associated with African Americans and slavery at the time of the Civil War than this one. In Nashville, Fort Negley is our only locally designated Civil War related landmark and one of only two African American related ones. What does it mean to have an overlay? You're probably familiar with historic zoning overlays in the neighborhoods such as Edgefield and Richland West End. It's the same for a landmark. It's a form of protection based on zoning. An overlay applies in addition to base zoning. Under an overlay, before any permit can be issued, changes to a property must be approved by the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, a board appointed by the mayor and approved by the council, as you are. By state and local law, changes must comply, and I'm almost through, I know the buzzer went off. Changes must comply with the nationally approved set of guidelines known as the Secretary of the Interior Standards. The goal of the standards that apply here is the retention of the form, features, and materials that make up the site's integrity and history. A necessary step toward reviewing any changes at Fort Negley is the preparation of a cultural landscape study. In February, this board, the Board of Parks, approved a match for a grant from the U.S. Department of the Interior to fund that study. That grant has been awarded and work will start this fall. This will allow for a thoughtful and thorough assessment of the future of Fort Negley Park. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we apologize for going over time. I will, I will take just one minute, if, if you will allow it. Uh, we, it's got to be one minute. One minute, okay. We believe that Fort Nagley Park is protected by the 2016 State Heritage Protection Act, uh, which requires a waiver uh, by, from the State Historical Commission before anything, uh, before uh, any park land commemorating a historic conflict can be altered. A 99 year lease on 440,000 acres and, or on 441 square feet of development on 21 acres is such an alteration. You, the Parks Board, would need a waiver from the state before you could award this. This uh, You would also need a Metro Historic Zoning waiver to the overlay. You would also need a Greenways Committee to conclude that Nashville does not need this city-owned green space. You would also need a very compelling reason to abandon our own park, uh, your own park plan uh, produced in 2007. Lastly, you will need to explain to other friends groups how and when legacy park land can be leased out or sold for development. Maybe the very park that uh, they are working now hard to improve and protect might be awarded out also. In such climate, future landowners would donate their land not to Metro Parks but to a land trust in order to ensure its protection in perpetuity. Uh, let's honor the work and make progress through preservation. Thank you. questions before we go to the next presentation well thank you for that um, our the next presentation again for informational purposes only today is mr. Devender Sandu representing Nashville Adventure Park to present an alternative option of financial package for Greer Stadium and Fort Negley site to the board for informational purposes only mm -hmm. 
Mr. Sandy, we got to try to keep this to 20 minutes or so, please. If you'd like to start, and please speak up because I was getting text messages from the back, people can't hear. So, good morning. What a wonderful uh, group we have here today. I'm glad and happy to see so much participation from our community. Seems like everybody's interested in what's going to happen at this site. Mr. Sanders, you're going to have to speak up because that microphone, I think, is for the TV, not for projection. So, no. so people want to hear you in the back. Okay, so you might you. want to face that way a little bit, too. Thank so. you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our park plan proposal for the Greer Stadium property next to Fort Negley. I want to be clear because I've seen a lot of this out in the, in the news media and so on that. Uh, that I'm a disgruntled proposer. I'm not disgruntled. I want that to be absolutely clear. I think, uh, I think the Matthews Group or the Cloud Hill Partnership uh, is, is a very good group. <coughs> Matthews uh, is an honorable, venerable organization, has, is one of the pillars of our society. So, and I consider them to be friends of mine. I am, however, disappointed in the selection process, the lack of transparency, and the disorganized RFQ that was presented here. So, you know, as an immigrant born in Kenya to Indian parents, I, was, I expected that I'd get the same chance as anybody else on this RFQ. And I don't think I was, especially when I finished fourth out of five in my diversity plan because it said my minority status had no meaning on, on, um, on the selection process. So I figured if they got that part of this selection wrong, what else did they get wrong? But, but I don't have, uh, I had earlier issues with this RFQ. I think this plan should have never gone out to developers. Uh, I came to Nashville as a 17 year old. I'm now gray and old and crippled. Um, so uh, I think that when I came here, I started exploring the city. And I saw this hillside in the middle of town with all kinds of growth. I had to fight brambles and everything else to get up to the top. Some of you got nodding because I went to school with you at, at the school. So fighting through the brambles, fighting through the thicket, I saw all this stonework. I said, what's going on here? There wasn't any marker. There wasn't anything up there to say that this was, this was an old fort. And you know, coming from India and from Africa, we saw a lot of old stuff that was preserved and part of the community. This thing, for some reason, was under all kinds of brush. This was in 1972. Since then, I went back many years. I'm glad the officer's not here because uh, I'm guilty of trapping many animals that my dad didn't want in his garden and take him to Fort Negley to release them. <laughs> Possums, raccoons, and more recently, the armadillos that they start coming north, right? 
Um, so I'm a, I've been a user of this park for many, many years. So when we came, when this, uh, when the Greer Stadium, when the Stowns moved out and Greer Stadium became available, I came to Metro Parks and I said, let's make this, let's preserve Greer Stadium, convert the rest of it into parkland, and use the Greer Stadium site as a resource to have for sports. But I was told that Greer Stadium is falling apart, which as an engineer I don't agree with. I think Greer Stadium can be saved um, and be reused and repurposed. It's done all over the world. I also believe that the site should be mainly a park. However, the RFQ process, when I was told that it was going to be open up to developers, I'd kind of given up. And then some developers came to me and said uh, they'd like to help me develop it as a, par as, as a development to meet the RFQ. Um, so we went at, at it. And we came up something that just was chock full, just filled everything up in the place with uh, something that would make money not only for the developers, but also to help sustain uh, and provide money to rehabilitate Fort Negley and um, uh, help with the Adventure Science Center and other things around there. So we, that was all in our proposal. When we didn't get the proposal, uh, we filed a protest and so on. All that's in the newspaper. You guys can read about it. I'd be happy to supply you stuff about it. But I want you to go, uh, but I want you all to know that um, what we're proposing here is a park plan. We've gone, we've gone away from the RFQ, and we're presenting the park plan. And our park plan uh, preserves the park, will not disturb any archaeologically or historically significant areas within the Greer Stadium and Fort Negley pr property. Now, with this, with this in mind, let us consider that all the plans that were submitted were flawed from the beginning because no one knew where the buildings would be placed. We had no archaeological survey. We didn't even know what the boundaries were of the 21 acres. They weren't given that to us. They didn't give those to us. So they, they, we didn't know uh, anything about the facility. So the RFQ itself did not provide us, even though we asked many times, where can we build, what can we build? Um, so with that in mind, I want the Metro Park Board to understand that we believe that you make the decisions on what happens to this property. This means it's in your hands. We don't think that it should be procurement office, it should not be the mayor's office, it's you. The property is in the name of Metro Parks. Metro Parks is a steward of this land. And if Metro Park Board considers that this property is surplus, then it should be offered to the other departments within Metro first, according to the procedure that I've read. I'm, I've been reading a lot about the laws of Nashville and they're just mind boggling. <laughs> so it has to go to the other departments first and then it has to go to Metro Properties to decide evaluate the property and then either offer it for sale or see what else can be done with it. And so that's what I think is the correct process. Now Metro Legal has said there's some gray areas and I think Metro Legal has said that they can do a long-term lease on it, uh, but I think there's a, there's a something, somebody needs to challenge that. That's not for me to do. I don't have the money or the time to do all that. So here are the questions I want you to think about. How did the procurement office get the right to decide what happens to Metro Parks property without your input? We don't think uh, Metro Parks had any input into this. Why were all the proposers put in a position to expend time and money to design plans on park property that was not considered surplus, no service provided, and most importantly, no archaeological and environmental service performed? Who wrote the RFQ? So there, there are many other flaws that we found in this thing. Uh, so again, we, we say that you have the decision on what to do with the property. You should make the ultimate decision on that. And uh, uh, I think we think that you can come up with your own plans, select from any of these alternative plans that have been put forth, like this wonderful um, Save Our Park plan. I don't, uh, I, ben is a great guy. He does good work. I, I like his plan. I don't agree with everything because he left the kids' sports out. That's, I'm about sports for kids and adults. And there's not, nothing at that site that uh, provides that. I think in that neighborhood, we need to have that, some of that also. Uh, so we can, con we would like to incorporate some of what uh, Ben Page put in his, in his plan. Again, uh, I think we need to take a deep breath, look at this wonderful s uh, facility we have in the middle of Nashville, and see what we can do that's best for the city of Nashville. Uh, and I'm not here. Uh, 
lobbying for my plan, but I would like to show you what, what we have uh, uh, what we have proposed. So, Sammy, if we'd start. So, you know, we recently renamed Freddie Douglas Park. We renamed it correctly to honor this great American, Frederick Douglass. It was about time we did the correct thing there. And Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to, than to repair broken men. Our recreation, park system, and so on helps us build strong children. So let's do that here. Use this park as one of, uh, as a legacy to Frederick Douglass. Um, so I want you to think about what this park can become. We envision, uh, you'll see up here, it's a Vietnam Memorial to all the men and women who gave their lives uh, in that war many, many years ago. It's only men. There are no women included. Thank you. And that's... Uh, There's a memorial that was added to the nurses and that was in that, that That's horrible. That's, uh, that's what happened there. Um, so anyway, we feel that we should have a memorial to all the men and women who gave their lives or were a part of this, uh, of the construction of this Fort Mitchell plant. And there were actually some Tennesseans from East Tennessee and West Tennessee who fought for the Union, and I think some of them lost their lives around this, uh, around this battle also, so they should be, they should be also be gone. So th I want you guys to look at this, and this could, we could envision something like this at Fort Negley. Next. Uh, from the 1990 to 2007 supplement to the 1996 Fort Negley master plan that you guys commissioned, this is what this is what you envisioned for it. You wanted to have a huge air, green area. You wanted to have parking. You wanted to have a future museum, and uh, you wanted to acquire some additional property, private property for ancillary uh, buildings and so on to support support this site. So this is available on the Metro Parks website. If anybody here needs to look at this, you can get the 2007 supplement to 1996 Fort Langley Master Plan. It is available. It's out there. Let's go next. Uh, and I think this plan uh, was another plan that was put out, a new deal for Fort Negley Park for the community. This plan, again, shows uh, Fort Negley gone, athletic fields, a museum, parking, uh, and, and uh, historic trails to go interpret interpretation panels about history throughout the, throughout the site, and part of the, and uh, maybe adding it to the greenway system. Um, so the Fort Negley friends of Fort Negley uh, has already presented their needs and their wants. We support all that. We support a Civil War museum. We support a children's park with a Civil War themed educational space walking paths and heritage walking trails dedicated to African Americans and other soldiers who built the, built the facility, uh, a link to the city cemetery, picnic tables and pavilions throughout, plenty of parking, protection of the view shed. Next. Um, now, here comes, uh, here comes something interesting, adjacent lands. Uh, ben Page mentioned that Vanderbilt University has a lot of acres to the south of the property. Uh, it's my understanding that Vandy is trying to develop uh, graduate, uh, graduate housing and uh, some offices down there. For, and the WeHo neighborhood, that Wedgwood-Houston neighborhood, is growing leaps and bounds with a lot of uh, high-density uh, residential. What a wonderful place for all these people to come to Fort Negley and have for recreation, for walking, for jogging, and whatever else they want to do there. So. The, so those adjacent lands are available, but there's a CSX railroad property to the east that we think is, um, would be wonderful uh, if it could be acquired, because that's in, that was in the master plan. Go ahead. Um, this again is, uh, this shows uh, the CSX property, which is uh, to the east of the site, about three acres. There's a private property to the north uh, that's owned by one of my old classmates and soccer buddies from Vanderbilt. Uh, connections in this town just go far and wide, so, you know. <laughs> uh, so we support, uh, additionally, we support the plan to play, which is another thing that you guys put together, the plan to play. And that had in it, you know, indoor sports, gymnastics, event and meeting spaces, which is different from what, uh, what the uh, Ben Page plan offers, 
We would like to offer that. Uh, more recreation and sports facilities for kids. We want to offer that. Um, there was also, I think, uh, uh, Metro Parks is looking for a way to uh, ra raise or re uh, have revenue generated through the park system, something that we've gone to other cities to see how, they're, how other cities are re uh, generating revenue at cafes or souvenir shops and so on. Maybe we could have something here, you know, work out some kind of s zoning or something to make something like, ha like that happen here. Um, so here's a save a park plan, which you've already seen, so I won't go, off, go through this. It, um, it's all green, but it doesn't address some of the things uh, we think, uh, like the Fort Negley Master Plan or the Plan to Play or even the African American community. I think Ben did allude to that a little bit, and um, so we support, we do support the Save Our Parks Plan, the All Park Plan, kind of. Uh, so here's the Matthews Plan. This is what was, uh, you guys uh, gave, uh, some time to a couple of months ago for their information only presentation. This park plan, like ours, is flawed. They've got 21 buildings on the site, all over the site. And we believe that takes away from it being a park, similar to what our original plan did. So I think that the RFQ, and that's no fault of, our, of Matthews, the RFQ required high density residential, they wanted workforce residential, they wanted affordable housing, they wanted uh, space where uh, you could have entrepreneurs start businesses and so on. So in reality, here's what the Matthews plan had. You look in red, it looked all green and white in the other one, but this is what that plan looked like. There were buildings everywhere. The rest were roadways and parking. Uh, you want to go back there for a minute, sure. please? I'll let you absorb that. All right, go ahead. So here's, here's our plan. It's called the National Adventure Park Park Plan. All right? It's all park for recreation with development on the neighboring CSX property. Whoops, where did that come from? Are we going to develop on CSX property? Would you allow that? Would that be OK with everybody? Well, it's private land, and uh, we think we have an in in on that. We think we have access to that three acres. And that will be presented here at the tail end of my, uh, my presentation. But if you look on this plan, I don't know what the, where the pointer went. I think the guy took off with it, Ben Page. Uh, if you look on my plan, um, we have, uh, we're saving Greer Stadium, OK? This was, original, this was the original concrete solid as the Rock and Gibraltar. Anybody know what Gibraltar is? The kids today don't even know what I'm talking about. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, he's not a kid. So anyway, we want to save that part. We want to take out the temporary steel bleachers that were here and replace that with indoor sports facilities, something we're dearly, dearly lacking in Nashville. Only city in Middle Tennessee that does not have indoor sports for the kids. Indoor soccer, lacrosse, rugby, indoor basketball, volleyball, right here. We want to save this, uh, this is not my best plan. My best plan saved Guru Stadium for a full-size soccer field or rugby field. But we want to have an area here where we can have a, like a lawn, where you could, people could sit in the bleachers, we could have plays here, we could have concerts, we could have all kinds of stuff happen while people are sitting in the bleachers. Now the office space that's back in here, Tennessee State Soccer Association has already approached me to move their offices there at probably sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, which is what Matthews are going to pay every year to Nashville for having the lease on all this land. Defender. There's one tenant who's going to come there. Yeah, I got it. So I'm about to finish here. Um, so this envisions the existing Greer Stadium, the footprint for the uh, uh, indoor recreation facilities. Go ahead. This is another option where I have my big field and a movable uh, stage. Here's a soccer field, again, uh, athle all athletic. This is a future farmer's market. If we ever have to move the farmer's market out, we could move that here and have some other buildings there with it and still have some re green space. Uh, that's, that can go on. So this, this envision, these pictures just show you some of the things that could happen within the existing Greer Stadium. It can be renovated, it can be made better. And uh, this is a summary of our plan. It, um, uh, I'm not going to actually go through a lot of this with you, but uh, 
Uh, you can read it on your own. I'll be happy to give that to anybody here in the audience that wants to look at that. Uh, a museum, uh, the commemoration and recognition of uh, uh, freed slaves. I have a little uh, uh, playhouse there for kids to play in. Uh, museums for Civil War. Uh, one of the things we want to do with our plan was uh, we uh, want to, many of the people who built this park were never paid. They were promised payment. They were never paid. We want to set up some kind of scholarship fund for FIST, TSU, and other schools that would remember the folks who put their lives on the line and gave their lives to build this fort, but were never paid. So that, those, those scholarship funds would be available for uh, minority students at, um, at universities here in Tennessee. Uh, Civil War Museum that I think can go there. And uh, again, just gives you a full-blown site. Uh, this is a community benefits agreement that I talked about, about how setting up scholarship funds. We're ready to sign this agreement. Next one, please. Uh, uh, there's a tax overlay. We, you know, we're spending, there's money available from, uh, from Ascent Theater. There's a certain amount of taxes that go towards paying, uh, towards a park foundation, and other recreation areas. So we, that's already done. And we can do something like that, like what the Ascent Theater has done, and also take money for hotel occupancy tax, tourist tax overlay, and so on, to help fund, to help these guys who work their tails off in Metro Parks with minimum budget. Every, every year the budget declines, we can help put money into that budget. And here's a, this is a park agreement led with the Sand Theater. You can go, you can ask your Metro County clerk to give you this. It's already done, it's Exhibit A. Get that, look at that, see how the money is being distributed. So we could be, our plan keeps 100% called park use, public-private partnership, 100% minority control company, that's me, with the, uh, running the uh, development, 100% open green space, all parks and recreation use, 100% public buildings and park on park property, no private buildings on the property. Additionally, we think CSX would add some additional land <coughs> out of the building where we're not going to put the buildings. They would be able to put some uh, uh, land towards uh, use by the public. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to the CSX guy. And then we can answer some questions. Do I need to come to the podium? Or you, you can stay there. Okay. We just have a few minutes, okay? Yes, I'm, I've got four slides. So uh, my name is Jamie Brandenburg. I'm with a company called St. Cloud Hill LLC. Not to be confused with the Cloud Hill development team. Um, don't mean to confuse anybody, but we named ourselves many, many months ago when we were starting to negotiate with CSX because the name of that hill is St. Cloud Hill. So just don't want to get that out of the way. But um, as you can see here, that's the swath of land that Mr. Sandu was speaking about. Uh, it's about three acres, and it's right contiguous to uh, the Fort Negley site, right beside Greer Stadium. And we have that under contract from CSX to purchase as a private company. Um, we looked at three different plans specifically when, uh, when the RFQ selection was made. And then, of course, we've been talking to Mr. Sandu. He's reached out, and, and we spent some time and just kind of looked at his plan. Really like it. I just want to point out, there's three plans laid up there. The Save the Parks plan is the one that's all green space, but you can still use our property to the right, and we can put two 14-story uh, residential buildings there that have commercial use on the bottom that do not mess with view sheds and keep the density of residential that's desired by Metro uh, near the site without affecting the site. So this is something we're proposing, and it works with all three plans. The Save the Parks plan, as you can see there, the Matthews plan, even if they did put all those buildings in, we could still add density over there um, with some residential. And I want to point out, too, that this is privately owned land that we could do condo sales on so we could actually deed the properties. We wouldn't have to just lease. People could be homeowners, which would be a big deal. Um, and then, of course, the Nashville Venture Park plan, which Mr. Sandu just presented to you, we fit right in with him. Same thing, he can keep density of residential units off the property. Uh, we can add about 470,000 square feet of, um, of residential mixed-use property. About 38, or I'm sorry, 34,000 of that would be um, neighborhood retail, commercial, at the very bottom. And we could also add three uh, levels of parking underneath our building so we could give adequate parking to all of that. As you can see here, it's about 572 units based on the configuration that we've imagined. Of course, we haven't done our archaeologicals and our surveys yet, 
Um, but when we do that, what we think can fit there is about 472 units, and you can see the breakdown there of what those units could be. We can play with that a bunch of different ways, but uh, those are 14-story buildings. Again, those are outside of the view sheds that we've been provided, so I think it would actually work out really nicely. Um, now, a couple of the reasons that we got passionate about this was when the RFQ process went through and we saw who was selected as well as the other plans that were presented, we noticed what we thought were some problems. Um, first of all, I don't think any of the plans had adequate parking. That's going to be an issue. With the park there, you're going to have to have adequate parking, uh, not just for the residents, but for people that are going to visit the park. And our land actually helps solve that problem. In addition, um, if the, the uh, Cloud Hill plan is moved forward with, or even the, the other submitted plans, there's going to be some issues with archaeologicals and some of those buildings aren't going to be able to be placed there and we offer the land to move those buildings to and a big one for me was i didn't see a real plan for stormwater management and as you can see we've drawn a uh, retention pond in at the bottom of our swath there we can actually help with stormwater management so uh, we're excited to be able to bring this property into the mix and uh, happy to talk to the parks department as well as uh, cloud hill and figure out how we can make this happen my Thanks. name is Jamie Brandenburg. By, oh, this is the letter from CSX just confirming that I have the property under contract. And that's my information. None of you know who I am. Excuse me, sweetheart. None of you know who I am. So that's my information. Sorry to hit you. It's okay. <laughs> um, Thank you for that. Yeah. So um, are there any questions from the park board? Uh, well, no questions. But just, um, I, knew that I think was. for us, for the board, and for me, I mean, we've been hearing a lot of information. This is great, and I appreciate the folks that are coming out and giving us, providing that. But I think for us, I would like to talk to legal more, um, just kind of helping us be clear on what's going on. Um, and so either we set a time to meet before our next board meeting or, you know, whatever, but I, I would like to propose that. Could you give us an overview? Well, and to be clear, nothing is going to happen until the appeal has been is wrapped up. That's a good point. The appeal was set for August 30th. Mr. Sandu withdrew his appeal. He has refiled it. I believe Metro has sent um, a few other potential dates. So we're in the process of selecting a date, and it will move forward. At the right time, would, that would be good to have an overview. Right. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. After um, yeah, yeah. the okay. appeal hearing, then okay. we can talk about next steps. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board before we proceed with our and finish up our meeting? Well, thanks to both groups for the uh, information and presentations, and um, we will proceed with our agenda here, uh, which is almost finished. Um, I just want to make two points before we get to the director's reports. Um, number one is that we have new committee assignments, which are in front of you, since now we have Mr. Haynes on board. Excuse me one second. Let's keep it down. And uh, lastly, um, as everyone knows, we're um, in the middle of, middle of a search for a director, and the interviews are starting uh, this week, and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, now I will turn it over to. May I have a question, yes. Mr. Chairman? Um, these committees, how do. We get, I mean, what are our responsibilities to get those set up? Are we so the committees? The committees, um, when something comes in front of us and we defer it to one of the committees in the top portion of that, mm -hmm. um, you will run that part of the committee meeting pre before our board meeting and then report back to the board for what so the findings. You'll tell, uh, me yeah. as a chairman when I need to meet. Right. There's no policy fee with you. It'll That's typically, it, right. And when something comes up, we'll defer it to that okay. and then. And uh, it's usually part of this meeting and before this meeting. Okay, and then on the liaisons, do we are uh, we automatically added to those entities and get information? Because I've not gotten any information about that. Yes, you should be, and you will be. Yeah. So, um, all right. So now I'm the here still. <laughs> yeah, now the report of the director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our council people here um, who are joining us today, uh, Councilman at Large John Cooper and Councilman Ed Kendall. Uh, and I don't see anyone else. If I have missed you, please forgive me. Um, I'll have three short 
Three short items that I'd like to mention. Uh, we sustained significant flooding at the Hartman Park Regional Community Center as a result of uh, Hurricane uh, Harvey a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'd like to commend our community center staff and our maintenance staff in working together and um, cleaning up that building and then to um, getting the center reopened. Our pool um, in that facility reopened on Thursday morning. Um, the, the maintenance crew is still working on the ground there at, at Hartman and then to the White Creek Greenway, which is uh, in close proximity. So our staff is still working to uh, repair um, the damages that were sustained in that park and in that community center. Um, the Tennessee Recreation and Parks Association Fall Conference Fall Conference will be held in um, late October. Uh, it will be in Franklin, Tennessee, and so because of the close proximity, we'll have several uh, teammates here at Parks who will be attending, and we're glad glad of that. There will all be also be awards associated with that conference. We have about 18 categories that we have submitted nominations for, including some of our uh, new and existing facilities, some volunteers, and some employees. So we're very hopeful that we'll come out successful in at least a few categories. Um, and then finally, um, the General Serv Metro General Services Department has given us two ele electric cars, Nissan Leafs. They turned th those over to us last week as a part of their sustainability program. If you catch, um, uh, if you watch Channel 3 regularly, myself and Mr. Rick Taylor, did a feature presentation uh, <laughs> at our acting debuts with Socket, the, what is he, the dog, the uh, mascot, the energy mascot, I guess, okay. Um, so if you catch that, um, but those cars have been given, us, given to us um, as a part of the su sustainability program of uh, general services to be used by our staff here in terms of um, going about the city handling parks business. So we will use those and there's a log inside that, uh, a meter that will be logged um, and we'll turn that over to general services monthly. So we're excited about that and folks are already starting to use the cars. <coughs> With that, I don't have anything else. All right, are there any other points or future agenda items that we need to add? Council McKendall. Uh, Council McKendall, did you wanna speak? Yeah, yes, okay, sure. Uh, sorry, I got here late. That was uh, that was an item on the agenda that I want to ask about. But I want to first of all uh, thank you guys for what you do. I got here late because I served on the park board for 11 years, and we always started at one o'clock. Uh, I think when Mr. Fossick first started the park board uh, <laughs> back in whatever that day that was, uh, we started. We met at one o'clock, but. There's a, uh, and by the way, Ms. Odom, thank you very much. The park stand, the bandstand at Handy Park was in total disrepair. Uh, I think after a couple of phone calls and encouragement, uh, they repaired that very substantially and, and did a beautiful job. And I want to thank you for that. But uh, that was what I was here for earlier, the naming of that for the Don Q pulling bandstand is what it is. And I was hoping that it may pass today so when they have the African Street Festival, which is in a couple of weeks, I would at least be able to announce that the park board had, had approved it. Of course, I realize it's got to go further. But uh, was that, was that- It was uh, deferred to the naming committee, so the next meeting- Oh, okay. So that, when is the next meeting? Uh, October 3rd. October 3rd. October. At 12. <laughs> okay. So you all have changed at 12 o'clock? Huh? You can come okay. before around 11.30 to the naming committee. Okay. Yeah, all right. We, back in 1901, um, when the <laughs> Parks Board started, it was <laughs> yeah, we changed When it Mr. Fossick started. <laughs> Joanne, how are you? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be there for you. We, we normally don't open the floor unless you're on the agenda, so. Okay. This was a part that was on the agenda. Um, I, I don't normally uh, uh, appear in front of uh, one of the events. I think it was table, and I was standing outside. I couldn't 
He's down in the hallway. I didn't know we, that anything was if, if you have, if you want to get on the agenda, you have to request to be on the agenda. So what again? No, it was the back to the bridge mixer that was on the agenda. <laughs> this thing, the oh, okay. I'm sorry. was down okay. the hall, and I, I didn't know what. We was made going a decision on. that that will stop. The music will stop at 11, like we do at the Send Amphitheater and all the other downtown events. Okay, I um, was here on behalf of Councilwoman Hurt. I think she said she had spoken with someone that it, that it would not be a problem because we were across from a scene. I'm not sure how late that goes, but we usually have the event on the bridge, uh, which is right up under where we'll be, and we go until 1 o'clock on the bridge um, there. Then this is, I'm sorry, this event was supposed to have happened several weeks ago on the show, on the uh, second dollar bridge it rained and so we had to postpone it and now we're having to do it in Cumberland but we usually go until one o'clock on the bridge so we were hoping to have the, uh, the ability to do the same thing the uh, event the event can go till one the music cannot go till one we, we voted on that okay. so uh, all right, all right. All right. Uh, if there's no other items I'll entertain a motion for adjournment so moved <laughs> This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.